Good morning, everybody. I'd like to introduce to you Kimberly Clough Larkin, class of 1987. Since becoming a member of the California Bar in 1998, Kimberly has worked exclusively in the field of Indian law. Starting as a law clerk and then attorney at California Indian Legal Services, Kimberly went in private practice as a partner at Foreman and Associates. Kimberly then served as in-house general counsel for the Morongo Band of Mission Indians before joining California's Tribal Families Coalition as the legal director and also returning to graduate school at Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley. Kimberly's career has always focused on advocating for tribes and native nonprofits and protection for tribal infrastructure. And I'm very proud to introduce to you Kimberly Clough Larkin. First of all, it's way too high. I feel like a munchkin. So I'm going to do this. Is that okay, Mr. Video? Cool. Um, and second, I do have some notes, but first I need to do my, anybody seen The Incredibles? Yeah. So this is my Edna impersonation with the glasses. Um, so good morning. Whoa, now you're out of focus. Okay, we're going to try to do both. Um, it's really, really nice to be here. And um, sitting where you are, I would be thinking, why am I going to listen to this lawyer um, talk at me for a while? So uh, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about my background, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Indian law and what that means. And my hope is that from this morning, you will take away a message of that you have some agency in power in your future and in the future of this country and this world. But I want to start with talking a little bit about being a troublemaker. And the reason that I want to do that is because when I was sitting where you are at Villanova, I was certainly that, <coughs> definitely a troublemaker. Um, many years ago, and when Mr. Bunn said 1987, that sounds to me like pre-Civil War, long time ago. Um, but the truth is, when I was sitting where you are, I probably wouldn't have listened to me. Right? I probably would have been maybe where you are, which is like, oh, another adult talking at us. Um, <clears throat> I hope that you are a little bit more engaged and maybe a little bit more of a troublemaker than I was when I was my junior, senior self here at Villanova. So I did get into trouble when I was here. Mr. Bunce is somewhat of a witness to some of that. Um, I still kind of get a laugh at the image of the headmaster calling my name at the academic awards ceremony towards the end of the year, uh, calling it out, <clears throat> then getting a little uncomfortable when he realized that uh, I was winning the religion award, but I was stuck at home suspended for having gotten in a bit of trouble. So a little awkward moment for him. I was none the wiser, sitting at home, probably watching a movie. In addition to getting into trouble, some for good reasons, I want to say, uh, a favorite of mine was defying the dress code, which I thought was sexist and very gendered. Got in a lot of trouble for that one. Um, some stupid trouble. Ditching because the waves were good down at Emma Wood. Not, not a good, smart idea. Don't recommend it. But the one thing was I did care about the world around me. I cared about what was going on, and I wanted to think that I might have some role in making the world a better place. Now, that's kind of lofty thinking, but I want to tell you that it's real and it's true for you. So in addition to getting into trouble, I also got into student leadership, for example. Oh, and I want to pause for a second. You want to come up here for a second? I want to just give a small gift to your student president. <laughs> Okay, so I want to give 
give you a shirt. This is from an organization that I work for. I think it's a cool shirt. You can turn it around. Well, every tribe, every child, every case. I might explain a little bit of what that means. I just want to thank, thank you. you. You're very welcome. Woo! And the reason that I wanted to give your student president a, a t-shirt today, it's a small token of just saying, hey, I've been there. It's, um, you know, being a student president might at some point feel like not a big deal, but it is a big deal. And stepping up and being a student leader is really important. And it doesn't mean that you need to be student body president. There's lots of ways to do leadership. I also played soccer, um, captain the soccer team here. We sucked, but it was great. Went on to play soccer in college, also great. So <clears throat> definitely blew a couple steps along the way. Um, Oh, another one was, uh, well, getting caught in the boys. No, actually, I didn't get caught. Can I take that back? They don't know about that one. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, anyways, totally stealth getting it out of the boys' dorm. That's for sure. Anyway, so uh, a Villanova trip to Europe. Decided to ditch the end of the Villanova trip and found myself detained in Europe. That was a good one. So some dumb stuff, right? But what I realized was that um, in moving on, I went on to USF, University of San Francisco. I didn't leave my troubles, uh, troublemaking behind, occasionally dumb decisions, um, but still that sense that I had a stake in the world was there. When I went to USF, and by the way, the choice of going to college, another dumb move, but I want to just assure everybody, not a big deal. So my family's from Eastern Canada. In Canada, when you go to college, at least according to my parents, you just go and sign up. There wasn't all this prep for going to college, didn't do the SATs and stuff. So I was like, hey, I love San Francisco. By the way, any Giants fans? Go Giants. Woo! And so I wanted to get the heck out of Ojai. So I said, oh, I love San Francisco. Look at the list. First one that pops up, San Francisco, University of San Francisco. Did I apply anywhere else? No. Did I look at Berkeley? No. Did I think about, you know, everything, all my friends that were taking these Princeton Review SAT courses and I was at the beach while they were doing that going, yeah, this is great. So I just went to USF. Great school, you know, just fine. First one I found. Did not define me. Where you go to college isn't the biggest deal. It might feel like a big deal to the seniors right now and to the juniors. Just want to let you know I am a testament to that it's not the biggest deal in the world. So I hope I didn't, don't tell your parents if they think it's a big deal. Don't tell them I said that. What's important is that you go to a place that will embrace you and that you feel like you can find your voice and your place. So I went to USF um, immediately started making a bit of trouble. Um, first one was uh, standing up at a lecture at which a father was speaking about work in Central America and challenged the head of the university to why the university had not divested from companies that were doing bad things in those exact countries. So that was my first suspension from college. But that's good trouble. I was calling out an injustice. Now, I didn't really know what I was doing. But it was important, and I had a voice. I continued on at USF calling for boycotts of class during wars that I thought were unjust. And like, who doesn't want to skip class? So it worked out really well. And then I found a little bit more of my voice in what I consider good troublemaking, which was I found out about a protest that had been taking place for a while out in the middle of Nevada. Kind of a weird thing, out in the middle of Nevada, why there? So I wanted to find out. So it turns out that out in the middle of Nevada at the time, the military was blowing up nuclear bombs underground out in Mercury, Nevada. Big installation, big fences around. And people would go out there and they would commit civil disobedience, jump over the fence and run out into the desert because they didn't think that blowing up nuclear bombs underground out in that place was a good idea. I happen to agree. So I organized students to go out there. Ooh, student organizing, that's so impressive. No, not really, it was, this is how it went. Hey, you guys, you wanna skip class, go camping, I'll pack all the food, road trip? Yeah, 
That's what student organizing amounted to. We drove out to Nevada. We camped in the morning. We scaled the fences. We ran out across the desert. These guys came out on ATVs, probably military police or something. They arrested us, took us to the little town next door. We gave fake names when they arrested us. What's your name, ma'am? Uh, Karen Bunnyhead. Oh, my parents have such a sense of humor. They'd hold us for a little while and we would leave. Now, why did I do that? And why did students join me? Because that was good trouble. At the time, we felt it was wrong that those nuclear bombs were being blown up in that place in Nevada. Again, finding my voice and figuring out that I could make a difference was really important. So, I got kind of curious about this whole thing with blowing up bombs in this place in Nevada. Why were they doing that out in the middle of Nevada and not like, I don't know, here in Omaha? Well, it turns out that the land was Shoshone ancestral land. People of the Shoshone tribe had lived out there since the beginning of time. And the rules in Indian country on Indian land are different than the rules, say, in Ojai, or LA, or San Francisco. The laws are different. And basically, the laws amounted to the government could do what it wanted on Indian land. It could take over and it could blow up nuclear bombs into that land. It could displace Native people. It's this concept of jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is the rules that happen in a place. And the rules in Indian country were a little bit different. So I want to pause here before I go way too far in the, down the rabbit hole of Indian law. I think it's really interesting, but I think Gamora can explain it much better. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a primer, thanks to my BFF, Zoe Saldana. This is just a couple of minutes, but it's a little bit of a primer about Indian law and tribal sovereignty. Did you know that Native American tribes are basically their own nations? In fact, they've been that way since well before the start of American history. It's called tribal sovereignty, but protecting it hasn't been an easy task. Let us explain. There are currently 573 federally recognized native tribes in the U.S., and every one of them has the right to govern themselves and their lands. Before the Constitution existed, before the U.S. itself existed, American colonizers struck tons of treaties with the indigenous tribes and thereby recognized tribes as independent nations. And when the Constitution was enacted in 1788, it too recognized their sovereignty, not just from the federal government, but also states and foreign nations. But soon after, their sovereignty was put at risk. In the 1800s, a series of Supreme Court cases ruled that indigenous tribes were domestic dependent nations, meaning they had lost certain rights of a self-governing nation like raising an army because they were seen as inferior people in the eyes of the United States Supreme Court. But there were more challenges to come. First, the federal government tried relocating all tribal nations by exchanging their homelands with less valuable lands. Then, when the tribes failed to assimilate, the United States broke up reservations by a process called allotment. Allotment gave each tribal member a piece of land with the hopes that it would become economically productive. But instead, it resulted in the loss of millions of acres of tribal property. In the 1950s, Congress passed legislation that aimed to assimilate Native Americans into mainstream Western society. More than 100 tribes were terminated and had their recognition and sovereignty revoked. The result was a flurry of economic and social issues for the Native community, issues that persisted even after the policy ended. Since then, Native groups have regained some of their rights and the government has taken a more supportive approach to tribal sovereignty. Today, tribal nations work to rehabilitate endangered species, restore their traditional languages, and address the epidemic of murdered and missing indigenous women in Indian country. But the debate still isn't over, because the right of Indian nations to self-govern is often being redefined and challenged, despite the fact that its history predates even the birth of our colonized nation. information. But basically the point is that in this country the rules are different when it comes to tribes and tribal people. And that was interesting to me. And the good news was that I had gotten an education starting at Villanova and at USF that allowed me to investigate that and look into that 
and figure out if I could find a way for me to have a voice in that conversation. And the good news is the answer is yes. I was able and still am able to have a voice in the conversation around tribal rights, tribal wrongs, and how this country, a country I care deeply about, does the right thing when it comes to Indian people and Indian tribes. Now, I happen to specialize in tribal child welfare. What that means is I specialize in laws that affect Indian families, Indian children that are in the foster care system. And I'll talk a little bit, of, a little bit more about that in a second. But I want to go back to kind of my realization that I had a voice and a stake in making a difference. So my troublemaking in San Francisco continued. Um, a couple more arrests, laying in the middle of the street, protesting, again, wars and foreign policy. And I consider that good trouble. Now, I had explained that to the California bar when I was getting my bar license, because they weren't so sure. But it was important in formulating my ability to think about what I had the power to do. So I decided, what about law school? All the stuff about Indian law and tribal jurisdiction and the role of tribes, why don't I try law school? Now, there's nobody in my family that's ever been a lawyer. Um, and I'll digress for a second to tell you, kind of embarrassingly, how the idea of going to law school actually snapped for me. And I'll tell you this only because life is sometimes a little bit unexpected in terms of where inspiration might come from, and I would implore you to stay open to people in your life who might deliver a message that you're not expecting. So I was working on a cruise ship, random, kid from Ohio working on a cruise ship, and in fact, doing the weirdest job on the cruise ship, which was teaching fitness classes. So right, this ship is going across the Caribbean, and I'm telling old ladies to sit in a chair and raise their arms when they're hungover from all the margaritas they've had the night before at the luau. Totally random. But at dinner one night, I'm sitting at a table with a bunch of former NFL football players. And me and this guy, uh, some Hall of Fame guy, uh, got into an argument. And there was a famous baseball player, you guys wouldn't know him, but his name was Daryl Strawberry. He was sitting next to me. And we got into this argument, and basically I won. And this NFL football player, oh, man, rah. And Daryl Strawberry, this pretty famous baseball player, said, man, you should be a lawyer. I kid you not. Not because my parents thought it was a good idea, not because anybody in college thought it was a good idea, not because I had this big dream about being a lawyer, because a washed up baseball player on a cruise ship in the middle of the Caribbean thought it was a good idea. And the message is, you don't know where a good idea might come from, so stay open, have an open mind. So off I went to law school. But a couple more bumps along the way. I started law school as a single mom of a nine-month-old, living in a very small studio apartment in San Francisco, having begged my way into law school because I had missed the deadline. I'd been accepted and had a full-ride scholarship to University of Wyoming Law School, a great Indian law program. But because of personal circumstances, I found myself back in San Francisco with a $35 futon that I'd bought from a person who was going into the Peace Corps in a studio with a nine-month-old. I happen to make it through law school because of the generosity of amazing adults around me, people who I consider now to be my heroes, law professors who shared babysitters with me. I got into a routine of, uh, I would put my son to bed around 7 p.m. I'd sleep until about 10 p.m. I'd wake up and I'd study from 10 to about 2. Then I'd go back to sleep until he woke up around 7 and get him to school. It was probably three years after I passed the bar exam that I stopped waking up at 10 p.m. in a panic, thinking I needed to study. So that was bumpy, but it didn't knock me off. You will hit bumps in the road. Don't let them knock you off. Don't let them take away from you the sense that you have a stake, and you have a voice, and if you have a goal, and you cultivate friendships and supports around you like I had in those law professors who helped me with childcare, you can do it. So graduated from law school. 
That nine-month-old graduated last week with his MBA from Pepperdine. I'm a little verklempt. Do you know what that means? Yes. I always throw a little Yiddish into everything. Uh, verklempt, it means, uh, what's it mean? Verklempt. Overwhelmed. Overwhelmed, caught up. Um, so along the way, lots of good trouble. Lots of opportunities to find my stake and my voice. You have that same opportunity. You will hit the same bumps, maybe not in the same format, but you will hit them. And you will continue to have a stake in the future of this country, in the future of your community, in the future of your country, in the future of the world. And we're counting on you because we have royally screwed it up. So please, do a good job. So, I want to be really clear. I have said this word, good trouble, several times. I did not in invent that phrase. I invite you to Google John Lewis and the word civil rights. John Lewis is one of my idols. He was a civil rights leader of no compare. In fact, actually, get into good trouble, necessary trouble. One of my favorite t-shirts, John Lewis. So find your way to get into some good trouble. You might get into some not so good trouble. You might, you should avoid the dumb trouble. But I want to ask you, what is your good trouble? What is it? How will you find your good trouble? How will you find your community that supports you in that? Who will you drag out into the desert with snacks on a road trip to cause some good trouble, wherever that may be? I challenge you. And I think your education at Villanova has prepared you for that. I am not Catholic. I went to Villanova. I went on to USF, which is a Catholic university. I was asked just this morning a little bit about why I think Villanova or how Villanova might have prepared me for my career. I'll tell you, one of the most important classes I took here was actually in religion. Apparently, I did really well. Apparently, I missed some lessons because I was suspended when they gave me the award, but I learned a lot. And one of them was critical thinking. Critical thinking and analysis, probably the skill that is most important. You guys can find all the facts and the data online. Now, I'm not saying it's not important to know some facts. You stand on the shoulders of history. You need to know that history. But the truth is, what you need to know is how to think and how to have that critical analysis. And when I was taking religion classes here and went on to take lots of religion classes at USF, the only non-Catholic in many of them, what I was striving for was that critical thinking. So I encourage you to take that. It's very, very important. And you can Google everything else. Not really, but close. So think about what will be your good trouble. What will be the dress code that you object to? What will be the fence in the desert that you will scale? What good trouble will get you to your path? And what will you say about the good trouble and the difference that you made in the world when you speak up? So that's the, the end of my kind of prepared comments about my experience at Villanova, and my career path and where I've landed. I want to tell you a little bit about actually the work that I do now. I think it's really interesting, and then I'd be happy to answer some questions. So, I am the legal director at California Tribal Families Coalition. What that means is there's an organization led by tri California tribal leaders. These are people who are elected by their people to lead their tribe, and they sit on a board of directors and guide an organization for which I am the legal director. The work that we do lives in three baskets. The first one is we go out and we make policy. And by the way, yes, I went to USF for my undergrad, but, and I never looked at Berkeley, but uh, in five days, six days, on Monday, I graduate 
from a master's degree in public policy from UC Berkeley. So, you know, it wasn't too late. So California, California Tribal Families Coalition works in three baskets. The first basket is in policy. So what we do is we go and we work with lawmakers, we work with policy people, we work in D.C., we work in Sacramento, and we shape policy around tribal families and tribal law. And then the second basket is we train people to that. So we say, hey, you know what? We got the law changed to help native foster kids, to help native foster kids stay in school, to help native foster kids get more services, whatever it is. And so then we go out in the universe and we train people to that. And we tell them, here's how the law has changed. And we go to tribal people, we say, here's how the law has changed for you. And then the third basket, which is my basket, is the legal work. So once we've changed the law to help Native people, once we've trained people to that change in the law, if they don't do it, I get to sue them. And that's the fun part for me. And that's where I found my voice, is being an advocate in that way, in the courtroom or in Congress or in Sacramento. And again, one of the key components of that is that critical thinking and that analysis and then also being able to find my voice, to be able to stand up in front of folks who don't really like the message that I'm going to deliver and try to get them to not only like it, but embrace it and then follow behind me as we make changes. That's a little bit of why you have that t-shirt, because leadership and stepping up here or in college, that's a skill that allows you to continue to have that voice and make change in the world, change that we need desperately. So that's what California Tribal Families Coalition does. You got a little bit of background in terms of Indian law from Zoe Saldana. I am more than happy to answer questions. Um, but that's it, and thank you for your attention. I'm a lawyer. If you don't ask questions, I'm going to ask you questions. Yeah. Yeah, so what's my opinion of the land back movement? Great question. Um, so do you mind if I explain a little bit about the, what the land back movement is? Okay, cool. So land back, great hashtag, complicated issue. Okay? So Cal I'm just going to use California as an example. You know, we talk about the concept of discovery, right? Um, I kind of joke sometimes. So, uh, and I apologize in advance, Mr. Bunce, if I say something I'm not supposed to say. Sorry. Getting in trouble again. Uh, when, when people from Europe discovered the United States, did they actually discover the United States? No, right? There were people here. In California, we have right now, I want to, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, somebody or a couple of you call it. How many tribes in California right now? Three. Three? Four? Two. 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 Okay, you guys are wrong. All right, I'm not good at math, but I'll tell you right now, you're wrong by a factor of 10. 109 federally recognized tribes in California. 109. <laughs> And then close to 30, maybe 40 non-federally recognized tribes. Right here in Ojai, anybody know? Where are we? Talk about land back. You are on native land right now. What is it? Chumash, thank you. Oh, the clapping is, the clapping is so obnoxious. <laughs> So land back is the concept that land that, that you are on, land that I am on, land that we occupy, some of it, perhaps all of it, should be given back to the original occupants, the native people of this country. Complicated issue, right? Because that's not doable, right? It's, it's not doable. So how do you do that? What does it look like to honor the idea that native people occupied this land and that, that some would say this country is built on stolen land and stolen labor? That's a super complicated issue. 
So the idea of lamb back is really, it's a, it's a great hashtag. It gets people thinking. It's a complex legal question. And I'll tell you that right now, the steps of the Supreme Court are littered with questions around land back. Two years ago, the Supreme Court heard a case. Again, you can Google it. It's called the McGirt case. And in the McGirt case, the question became, if the treaty between the five, eight, one of the five civilized tribes in the Oklahoma area, the Old Indian Territory, if that, if that treaty was never abrogated, meaning kicked out or canceled by Congress, who owns that land when non-Native people occupied it? And what the Supreme Court said, and part of why we have the land back movement, is that treaty has to be honored. And so as of about two years ago, about a fourth of Oklahoma, including the city of Tulsa, is now Indian country. Talk about land back. And the win in McGirt, that's one of the five civilized tribes, has now turned into a conversation around the other of the five civilized tribes also gaining land back. Going back to something I mentioned when we started, jurisdiction, it's raised tremendous jurisdiction questions. Who has jurisdiction? If I'm here and the police can't arrest me because I'm in Indian country, but I go over here and I'm not in Indian country anymore, can the police arrest me? Can the tribal police arrest me? Can the state police arrest me over here? All of that has to get worked out in the courts. So land back, again, interesting hashtag, complicated legal issue, and we as adults are leaving it probably on your laps to figure out. Thanks for the question. Any others? Yeah. Don't clap again. <laughs> nice try. Yeah? What are some of the benefits and also some of the pitfalls of social activism? Benefits and pitfalls of social activism. Um, well, one of the benefits is you have something to say when you get asked to talk at your high school. <laughs> um, look, nothing in this, in our democracy, Nothing in our democracy, and you guys are the beneficiaries of this, nothing in this democracy, this messy experiment, happened without social activism. Without people standing up and saying, I have a stake in this, I have a voice in this, going back to the founding of this country. That's where it all started. And I mean, any modern democracy, right? There's an element of, of social activism. I think the other piece for me, just on a personal level, is that when you find your people and you come together and you work towards a greater good, man, that is just the best, right? That's like the Giants win a fourth ring in my lifetime plus lots of unending chocolate ice cream all wrapped up into one. Coming together with people that you like, who have shared values, who care about something you care about, and getting to do social activism with them, I think it's maybe why we invented college. Because that's what's going to happen. You're going to get to college, and you're going to find your peeps, and you're going to engage in some activism, whether that's on a field or in a classroom or outside of both of those. And that's where you start to really find your voice and figure out what it's like to do this thing called adulting. Hope that answered your question. I think I see a hand. Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Biddy. Say that one more time for me. Yeah, absolutely. So the question is, any skills to develop before becoming a lawyer? First one, learn to live without a lot of sleep. Um, so if you're looking at your undergrad degree, it doesn't really matter. Ironically, law school is one of those fields that you can go into with essentially any undergraduate degree. So enjoy your undergrad, do what, what makes your heart sing. For law school, seriously think about what is my skill set. People often think law school is kind of cookie cutter. You get an impression of what a lawyer does on TV. And people say to me, for example, sometimes, oh, Indian law, that's such an interesting little niche. Actually, it's completely not. It's so different than what people think. Indian law is a veneer on top of every area of the law. 
So as general counsel for the Morongo Band of Mission Indians, which is one of those big gaming tribes outside of LA, I did environmental law, land law, elder law, child law, police, we had a police department, we had a school, I had to learn education law, I did every area of law. So the main skill that required was being a, being a fast read and knowing who to call to say, okay, I have an education issue, I don't know education law, can you help me brainstorm this? That was absolutely crucial. So make good friends with all your law professors, <laughs> that's one skill. Um, and then that critical thinking, right? Because what being a lawyer, and, and honestly I think a lot of careers, really what you have to have is that critical thinking and that analytic mind. And you guys have developed that here, hopefully, in part. I know when I was here, and I don't know, you guys have probably heard of Father Glenn. You know about Father Glenn. Do you guys have to take Latin anymore? You do? You don't have to. You don't have to, but you can. Yeah. So when I got my Latin book, which I think was published before the Civil War, carved in the front of it was Latin killed the Romans and it's killing me too. Great introduction to learning a foreign language. But I will tell you, actually, it was really good for analytical skills um, and also learning how to live with a little bit of sleep deprivation. Um, and I used it, actually, because, for example, in the law, right, race equilopium, um, all kinds of terms, they all come from Latin, and so I always feel like, oh, I got a little leg up because I had to take Latin. So the point is, it's a great question, and it's a whole host of skills that you need if you want to be a lawyer. And then the very last thing I'm going to say is that the image you may have of being a lawyer it involves a person who gets a law degree and then they go and that's the thing they do. More and more in my field, people get a law degree and then they do something else. So I have friends who got law degrees and then founded telecom companies. A friend who got a law degree from Yale and now he makes movies. Um, I have friends who went into medicine, who did law and then went into medicine. So I think it's one of the, the most versatile because really it's learning about thinking and a way of thinking. So that's my pitch. I've loved it. So if anyone's like, oh, it sounds so boring. I don't know, I think it's great. It's been really fun. But a key is, again, finding your voice and finding your, what fence you're gonna scale. Because any career is not gonna be any fun if you're not having fun in it. Any more questions? Marie, yeah. is there a particular thing you're working on right now? Yes. A particular issue, or can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, two, two big ones. Um, you want to hold up your shirt? Show everybody again? Okay. So, one of my biggest projects right now is LC4T, the Legal Council for Tribes. Getting a lawyer for every tribe, every child, every case. What that is. There's a law called the Indian Child, thank you very much. You have a future in game show. <laughs> um, if the law thing doesn't work out. Um, okay, so Legal Council for Tribes. There's a law that provides tribes the ability to be involved in cases involving their kids, their tribal citizens, if their tribal citizens find themselves in the foster care system. Foster care system is a system we have in this country where if kids' parents aren't taking care of them, neglecting them, or abusing them, it goes, the kiddos go into the system and the system tries to help them. This law was passed in 1978. It's called the Indian Child Welfare Act often called ICWA, and I do a lot of my work in ICWA. And what that law did, or what it was trying to fix, was a history in this country of family separation, removing kids from their parents as a tool of genocide, a way to fix the Indian problem in the United States was to take people's kids, Native people's kids, away from them. It started with taking people's children in California, primarily taking native kids away from their families and making them, entering them into what was, has become slavery. And that's not me speaking, a wonderful book, anybody's interested, called An American Genocide by Benjamin Madley, happy to give you the citation, which talks about the removal of native kids from their families and those kids being put into indentured servitude or slavery in California as a way to fix the Indian problem. And then the policies of the United States moved on to boarding schools, actually. That's one of the latest chapters in how to fix the Indian problem in the United States, 
We had three Indian boarding schools here in California. One of them very close, actually two of them, very close to where I used to be general counsel, the Morongo Band of Mission Indians, a Sherman Indian school and another small Indian school near Morongo. So the idea was, well, we can kill the Indian and save the man, take the native child away from their family, have them live as non-native, and then we will solve the Indian problem. And so in 1978, Congress passed a law that said, hey, that was wrong. We got it wrong. We are going to fix that problem, and we're going to pass this law that's going to protect Native kids and not allow them to be separated from their families so easily and so quickly. So that's the Indian Child Welfare Act. So I do most of my work in that. And in that law, there's a provision that tribes can be part of a case involving one of their Indian kids. It can be a party. Not anybody can be a party in one of these cases. They're confidential. The problem is that Congress said tribes can be a party in these cases, but it made no provision for them to have lawyers. Now, I want you to imagine you're a non-lawyer, you're walking into a court case, and the judge says, hey, what's your position? You've never been to law school. You have no idea. Is that going to go very well? Probably not going to go very well. So a bunch of tribal leaders um, got together, and they said, we've got to change this in California. We've got to figure out a way to get lawyers for tribes when they need to go into court to protect their kids. So those tribal leaders asked for uh, a meeting with the person who's now the vice president of the United States, but at the time she was the attorney general, Kamala Harris. So we sat down and said, this is a problem. The response was, put it in writing. So we spent about two years putting together a report. We then delivered it to the then attorney general, who's a gentleman named Javier Becerra. And he said, great, thank you. We'll look into it. And those tribal leaders said, we've heard that before. We've had nice... Try, uh, governmental uh, agents say that they'll help us, and they never did anything. So they said, hey, we need to form an organization that's going to follow up on this report. And that's how my organization came into existence. California Tribal Families Coalition was created by tribal leaders to make sure that the recommendations of that report are followed through on. The number one recommendation is that tribes need lawyers in courtrooms when their kids are in the foster care system. So today, probably, maybe tomorrow, I will find out if the governor is going to account or to provide about $15 million to my program to launch Legal Counsel for Tribes in California. It will be the first in the country. So everybody, cross your fingers. Come on, Gavin. Bring it home. <laughs> The second project is that there is a case sitting uh, before the Supreme Court. It'll be heard in October, and it involves exactly one of these types of cases. It involves the Indian Child Welfare Act, and it involves the state of Texas saying that the Indian Child Welfare Act is unconstitutional. And so oral argument is in October, and right now I spend probably 50% of my days speaking to tribal leaders around the country getting them organized and in support of the tribe's position, which is that the Indian Child Welfare Act is a good law, needs to stand, and is not unconstitutional. Um, spend maybe 20% of my days talking to people in Congress and people in the California legislature about why they should support the Indian Child Welfare Act. Spend about 50% of the rest of that time writing briefs, and then about 50% of the rest of the day falling asleep. Oh, and then grad school, and three kids, and two dogs. So that's what I do. So I assume, unless there's any more questions, that you have had enough of me. And, oh, one more question? Yeah. Oh, how rigorous was it studying for the bar exam? <laughs> um, so, again, it was around 6 a.m. 
to 8 a.m. and then get up and get a kid to school, and then 8.30 to 3, studying, and then pick the kid up from school, teach the kid how to make his own breakfast, I mean his own dinner, he is very good at making pancakes, still to this day, and then study again through the night. Do that for uh, about three months, and then sit for the bar exam. I have the unique distinction of being the only person I know who fell asleep during the bar exam. Now, not a full falling asleep. I didn't completely nod out, but like head went down, hit the desk, dropped the pencil, woke up, and went, oh my gosh, I think I just fell asleep during the bar exam. Happened twice. Still passed. Kind of amazing. Um, <laughs> people sometimes don't pass the bar and they take it again and then they pass or they take it twice or they take it three times. The bar exam like the SAT probably like some of the exams you've taken in high school are not a measure of your brilliance or your smarts. They are often a measure of your determination and your discipline. The bar is the same. The material is hard. Don't get me wrong. But like so much, don't measure yourself by if you got the answer right or wrong, measure yourself by did I try my hardest, right? And then once you do it, once you pass, just go take a big nap. That's all I can recommend. Yeah? What's the most difficult part about being a lawyer? The most difficult part about being a lawyer. <clears throat> a two-part answer. So I'm going to tell you one of the hardest cases was an 11-day trial that I did. Um, being away from my family for 11 days was hard, but it was a child torture case. Um, and that was hard to see kind of the worst of humanity for many, many hours over and over again is hard. Um, so that's hard about being a lawyer. Sometimes the material in front of you shows you some of the worst that humanity has to offer. On the other hand, sometimes you get to see the absolute best. You get to see families that are broken come back together. You get to see rights vindicated. People who were wronged get their day and see that they have a voice and that they're heard, that they're good enough to participate in, in this democracy, that's great. Um, the other hardest part is that sometimes you don't have the answer. And I think that when you are a good student, when you go to a school like Villanova, you go to college, do everything right, and then someone comes to you and says, hey, I'm going to hire you and you're going to give me the answer, and you don't have an answer for them, that's hard. And it requires some humility. So I'd say one of the other hard parts about being a lawyer for me is to always, always have that grace and humility when I feel like my job is to know the answer and to be able to fix everything. And I'm going to digress for just a second. I'm sorry, will you do a time check on me? Because, you know, I charge by the hour, so I'll just keep on talking. All right, last question. Well, I'm going to use it to just digress for just a moment, okay? So I uh, am a lawyer. I'm in my career, I'm chugging along, things are going great, right? I'm, I'm in private practice at a small Indian law firm. I'm exactly where I wanted to be. And then my son, my youngest, who is now 15, we're walking to school, he's in kindergarten, and he looks at me, and this is a walk we've done every day, and he says, Mom, I'm too tired to walk. And I said, hmm, something's wrong. Now, I was flying to Atlanta to see my oldest, who is at Emory University, a great school in Atlanta, Georgia, and because uh, he was turning 19. So I said to my husband, hey, will you make a, a doctor's appointment for the little one? His name is Jake. So my husband did, and um, I got a phone call. I was sitting at Dim Sum in Atlanta with my oldest, and here's the phone call. It's my husband. Hey, honey, what did the doctor say? And then it's this female voice, and she says, hi, this isn't your husband. This is Dr. So-and-so. Your son has leukemia. Okay? So in that moment, it, nothing mattered. The next case didn't matter. Being a lawyer didn't matter. Nothing mattered at all. Life threw me a curveball that I didn't expect. 
and I didn't have an answer, and I couldn't fix it. And that was really hard. And that took humility and grace and took me right back to when I was a single mom in law school. I needed my community. I needed kindness. Now, he's 15. He's a freshman. He's much like many of you. Probably thinks I am completely boring. And I went on and I continued in my career. He got better through the grace of God and the grace of the universe. He ended up not having leukemia. He had a, a disease, we, we joke, I should have taken him to the casino when we got this diagnosis. Uh, leukemia is like a one in 10,000 diagnosis. He had like a one in 10 million diagnosis, so like odds on that boy. And his life was saved by the one person out of 17 million people in the world who are in the bone marrow donor registry who had gotten tested to see if she could be a match. You guys ever heard of how people get bone marrow match, right? Help people with cancer? Um, her name is Jane. She lives in England. She said yes. She donated bone marrow and she saved his life. And that's it. So you can plan all you want. You can climb all those fences. You can find your voice. You can nail your career. You can do all the hard stuff. You can pass the bar. And then life can throw you a curveball. And you are reduced to saying, I need the kindness of others. I need to find my voice. I can't solve this alone. And then you kind of give it up. And you just rely on yourself and your family and your community. And you hope. And being a lawyer didn't mean squat in any of that. So that was hard. It's the hard part about any profession is it's not going to solve all the problems. OK, I don't want to end on a down note. Like, that's actually a really happy story, right? So anybody who's been touched by cancer, I want to just say thank you. When you get to college, when you turn 18, my very last pitch, be the match. It's a mouth swab. You get your name and your DNA into the registry, and you could save a life like a teacher in England saved my son's life.